I think that if you care about someone and you got a little love in your heart, there ain't nothing you can't get through together. You know what I'm saying? Everything about Ted Lasso is great. What? He said the thing? I made that joke. Yes, you did, dear viewer. And even if I've acted annoyed in the past about it, secretly I love it and you for it. It's a great joke, and it applies to about eh, six movies I've done. But you didn't come to Cinema Wins to talk about movies, obviously. Today, you're here to talk TV, or listen TV. Huh, that verb doesn't work that way. And if you're a fan of my channel, it's probably no surprise that I love Ted Lasso. I mean, it's essentially the ethos of my channel in show form. Positivity, optimism, soccer, blonde ladies. But it's just so effing wholesome. Like me, but not wholesome in a sanitized for the kids way. Or that weird ultra violence is cool, but boobs are bad way. Wholesome in a way that makes you feel okay about the world and also laugh at a good fart joke while admiring some Brits workout routines and beautiful beards. You know, cinema wins bread and butter. So it shouldn't be a shock to anyone that I think Ted Lasso is a perfect television show. Now, let me be clear. I am not saying that Ted Lasso is the perfect television show. That award goes to Patriot. No, I won't be taking any questions, but it is a perfect show. Its three seasons follow a classic three-act structure, and like the OG Star Wars films, the second one was initially thought to be inferior and in many ways too dark. Yet looking back at it, it's actually exactly what the story needed. Ted Lasso has everything you want. Likeable characters, unlikable characters, real stakes, real consequences, real relationships, betrayal, redemption, forgiveness, soccer, football from now on, lots of dirty jokes, it's great, and it's over. And while on one hand that makes me sad, on the other hand it's part of the reason it's perfect TV. So look, just in case you haven't watched it, I'll be spoiling some stuff here and there, even though it's not really a show that can be spoiled, but let me sell you on it with one tiny scene from the pilot. <laughs> with the girls and the champagne and everything, he looks like a good time. That's my ex-husband. Well, good times aren't always a good time. I heard about all that. How are you holding up? Yeah, hasn't been the easiest year. The context is pretty explicit. It's a solid, albeit simple setup and punchline from Jason Sudeikis, your comedy, and then he immediately goes full 100% sincere and asks Rebecca how she's doing your wholesomeness. It's so clear to Rebecca that he's being genuine while not trying to be intrusive that she nearly tears up and responds honestly. That's the show right there. There's no one that Ted can't wear down and no one that his positivity doesn't rub off on. An actual, real life nice guy. That's about 11 minutes into the pilot and that's when I was hooked. Get my man Nate here on the horn. You are a godsend, Ted Lasso! Of course, one of the arguments against the show is that Ted Lasso himself is in fact too perfect. Sports Jesus, if you will. Metaphor. He's a cishet white dude who somehow gets it, nails all his relationships, always knows what to say, teaches a team of professional football players how to play a brand of football they've never played before, while he himself has never even played the game, eventually landing second place in what is arguably the best league in the world. But I'd say that take is a misunderstanding of the show and the events therein. Because Ted isn't perfect. It's very clear he's not perfect. Those who follow the Premier League and conceivably professional sports in general knew that from day one. He accepted a job coaching a Premier League team as a Division II college American football coach. He even asks his best friend and right-hand man if accepting the job was crazy, and Beard says this. Yeah, this is nuts. That's all in the first episode. Now, plenty of things slip by in pilots because we're still getting comfy and learning the characters, figuring out the tone, etc. But that doesn't change the fact that from the jump and for myriad reasons, Ted genuinely shouldn't have taken the job. And when Rebecca finally owns up and apologizes to him, he makes it clear that he took the job in response to his split from his wife. It's part of the reason he's so quick to forgive Rebecca. They're going through similar heartbreaks. And I mean, after his wife visits and it becomes clear they're splitting up, Nate asks Beard if Ted is all right, and Beard hilariously responds. <laughs> Gosh, Beard is the best. Is, Be is Beard always a win? Beard is always a win. In other words, Ted is only perfect if you're not actually paying attention. And to expand on that forgiveness scene a little bit, I'm definitely not the first to say or think it, but that scene is such a huge expectation subversion. That storyline is prime drama for any other show. There's three episodes at least of comedy built right into Rebecca's betrayal and Ted trying to forgive her. But not only would that not be Ted, it wouldn't have worked for the show. Rebecca does the right thing and Ted immediately turns it around and comforts her. And even more importantly, he doesn't hold it against her going forward. So when season two dropped, tons of people said the show had jumped the shark. And while season two had a few hiccups in my opinion, it made perfect sense in the story. It is the very model of an act two. Expanded on certain characters and relationships, made stark choices that in the moment felt out of place, but the more you think about it, it makes sense. Nate, I'm talking about Nate there. But then after the bummer of a second season, the third season E walked onto our screens and into our hearts and all was well again. Except now Ted Lasso wasn't gritty enough. But we have to go back to season one to explore that. August 2020, the first summer of the pandemic, or panty as some would learn to call it, 
Nobody really knew what to do. Existential dread began to permeate humanity. A lot of people were stuck at home, which meant lots of TV and movies needed to be consumed. Also, doom scrolling Twitter. And without that, some shows may have never popped off like they did. You're welcome, Tiger King. I'm never gonna financially recover from this. But one of these shows that deserved the attention was Ted Lasso. And we loved how uplifting Ted Lasso felt, the very thing that everyone would complain about a year or two later. Suddenly, our 1989 era was over and our reputation era had come back. No more fun, only pain and cynicism. The way the world really is. None of this unrealistic forgiveness nonsense. So season three ends up being super feel good and according to some is now boring. It's not real enough, it's not grim enough. It tackles too many issues. Never mind that almost every issue that it addresses is a real issue in professional football. Racism, homophobia, team owners attempting to start a super league to make money. All you need to do is read about the recent experience of Real Madrid player Vinicius Jr. playing against Valencia to know that racism is still very real in the sport. Never read the comments, but if a club posts something in support of pride, believe me when I say for many clubs, clubs, many of those comments are vile. And the Super League thing literally happened. Just instead of Rebecca saving the day, it was the fans who protested and had the league stopped. For now. Those plot lines that many considered over the top were essentially the most realistic part of the show. Of course, realism was never the point of Ted Lasso. Anyone who knows anything about Premier League football knows that AFC Richmond's Nelson Road Stadium would have been burned to the ground if Rebecca actually hired someone with his job experience. I mean, it's mental. They're gonna Muddy. Ted's good attitude aside, there's a good reason everyone thinks he's a dum-dum in the first couple episodes. He is. A lovable, optimistic dum-dum, but still a dum-dum. As the show progresses, Ted's optimism doesn't go away, it changes. He wants to win, he wants to succeed. He wants to live the best life he can, and to live the best life you can, you can't pretend everything is fine when it isn't. He stops avoiding his problems with, as many have said, toxic positivity, and starts addressing them. Ironically, even then, it's hard for him to crack his own jovial crust. The first time he tells the doc about his dad, he does so through a smile for as long as he can possibly hold. But the scene with his mother, affectionately known as the thank you F.U. scene, is a perfect example. Thank you for all the small, silly little things you did for me as a kid, you know, like putting googly eyes on the fruit at the supermarket just to make me laugh. And fuck you. Not working on yourself or seeking help after we lost dad. The whole episode, he tries to be the same old Ted, but it finally boils over and he addresses the problem. And it's super rough, but so well done. And yet, despite things getting real real for a while, many folks still feel like the show was too feel good. And I'm sorry, but who called the fun police? Because while everyone complains about the syrupy, sappy feel goodness of Ted Lasso, The Bear is the new favorite, somewhat gritty show that everyone loves. And believe me, I also love it. I love it so much. It's so well done. However, wait, uh, first. Okay, now that that's out of the way, get ready to have your brain explode out your butt. Here we go. However, Ted Lasso and the Bear are the same show. Huh, kinda expected more butt explosions. Such is life. Here's what I mean. First off, they're not the same. I know I just said they were, but I wanna make it clear. I know they are very different. Secondly, I wanna make it clear that I'm not saying this is a bad thing. There's nothing new under the sun. What I mean is we get the same return from both shows, the same emotional high. They both give you the heartwarming feeling of it might all be okay, even if it isn't because the overarching goal and message of the bear and Ted Lasso is the same. They just do it in polar opposite ways. A yin to the other's yang. They both have ensemble casts surrounding a flawed but immensely likable main character who's entering a new phase of their career where they seem out of their element and no one seems to like that at first. Also, they both cook the end. But Ted Lasso is an overtly positive show whose emotional gut punches are based around rough things that happen, with few exceptions. And The Bear is an overtly anxious show where everything is falling apart whose emotional gut punches are based around something really wonderful happening, again, with a few exceptions. The awful stuff in The Bear is awful, but you expect it to be awful. I mean, I'm not sure anyone was prepared for the Fishes episode, but it's not surprising. And while Beard Forgiving Nate is wonderful and made me cry, it wasn't particularly unexpected, not in a it's predictable way, just that it's how the show moves. And if you're caught up on the newest season of The Bear and thinking, but it ends so, so sad. Sure, and season two of Ted Lasso ends with Nate betraying Ted by telling Trent about his panic attacks and going to West Ham. That's Empire, baby. They might have some layers that need to be peeled off, but in the end, it's the same message. These are both shows about good people trying to do good. Oh, another similarity to The Bear, platonic male-female relationships that in most shows or movies would become romantic that are allowed to stay platonic while still being deeply important to the characters a la Rebecca and Ted versus Carmi and Sid. While I'm at it, Ted and Rebecca have one of my favorite platonic loving relationships ever. There were moments I caught myself wishing they would get together. What's that? Like romance pilled? I'm romance pilled, I think. But I'm extremely glad I never got what I wanted because seeing a real true friendship like this is refreshing. Going crazy. <laughs> no more than anyone else. There we go. 
But shows like Succession, Breaking Bad, Barry, and at least early Rick and Morty are about bad people. Obviously not everyone is bad, but overall those shows are about bad people. And I love those shows, they're fantastic, but loving shows about crappy people doesn't mean you can't also love shows about great people. And complaining about the overt positivity of Ted Lasso is kind of like complaining about the violence in the John Wick movies or explosions in Michael Bay movies. Tom Cruise running. It's totally okay to not like it, but it's also a major feature of what you're watching, so you kind of need to meet it where it's at or maybe don't watch it. And like with those examples, I think when you embrace those aspects, your enjoyment increases exponentially. Ted Lasso's positivity pays off, and by that I mean the writers knew what they were doing. Ted's golden retriever-esque dopiness becomes grating when it's supposed to. It was clear in season one that Ted uses positivity to cover up his emotions. And while this may not lead to his panic attacks, it sure as crap doesn't help them. The show is also filled to the brim with little moments and subtleties that prove it can use that unbridled positivity for set it up, knock it down joke structure. Roy quietly sings along to let it go at karaoke because of course he does. He's always hanging out with his niece Phoebe. There's no way he hasn't seen Frozen a million times. The character development is subtle and organic. Wait, Roy is Richie, an angry naysayer who thinks it's all bullcrap and then becomes a true believer while going through a huge and painful transition in his life that he'll ultimately find fulfillment in that he never imagined possible. Same show. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, another one of my favorites is Rebecca. Yes, we know she apologizes to Ted at the end of the first season, and poof, is that scene well done. But she seems to never let go of wanting to watch Rupert suffer. She wants to see him in pain. But Rupert's last scene sees the entire stadium of his childhood club chanting wanker at him. And yes, he sucks. But Rebecca doesn't take part and even looks a little sad because she's moved past wanting to see him suffer. It's not just Rebecca is a good person now, it's the end of one of her arcs. She started the show wanting to cause him pain and ends it taking no joy in watching him have probably one of the worst moments in his life. Also, as an aside, one of my favorite episodes and storylines was her time in Amsterdam with the quiet burly man and then full-on rom-com running into him later in the finale. Yes, please. Hey, Marcus goes to Copenhagen to make a tasty dessert. Rebecca goes to the Netherlands and meets a tasty dessert. Okay, maybe that one's a stretch. It really is. Ted Lasso uses the titular character's over-the-top optimism to lay the groundwork that makes the series multiple gut punches work so well. Despite being full of hilarious one-liners and genuinely laugh-out-loud moments, and when it comes to locker rooms, I like them just like my mother's bathing suits. I only want to see them in one piece, you hear? The emotional rough patches are far and away the best moments of the show and what it will be remembered for. A few examples, Ted's first panic attack at karaoke, Roy, Jerry, Maguiring Ted to join the coaching staff, Rebecca coming clean to Ted, Nate going off on Ted, Ted revealing that his father died by suicide, Beard forgiving Nate, Ted just always being there for Rebecca at the charity events, at darts, just always. The entire final episode. One of my favorites is the insane emotional whiplash when Jamie's dad is berating him before shoving him. We're angry and feeling sad for Jamie, then surprised and a little thrilled when Jamie punches him, but then the reality of the situation settles in and we realize how devastating it would be for Jamie. But not before the man himself, probably the guy on the bottom of the list of people you'd expect to do what he's about to do, hugs Jamie and gives Jamie and all of us a huge emotional release. Tears, all the tears, still. But there is one line to me that exemplifies the whole series. In fact, I think about it quite a bit. At the end of season one, when Richmond has just been relegated, Ted says, And I want you to be grateful that you're going through this sad moment with all these other folks, because I promise you, there is something worse out there than being sad, and that is being alone and being sad. Ain't nobody in this room alone. It doesn't fix anything, it doesn't change the fact that they lost and they're sad. It's simply a way of seeing the world differently, a way that acknowledges there are always gonna be times that are total crap, but we can't do it alone. Humans aren't supposed to do it alone. It's why Walter White and Barry are the bad guys. Despite their rhetoric, they're selfish, crappy dudes. They always say it's for their family or to keep everyone safe, but they're lying and it catches up to them. Walter even admits it. On the other hand, Ted leaves Richmond because he wants to put his relationship with his kid first. The comparison is interesting to me as well because we all wanted to see Walter go full anti-hero villain and become Heisenberg, and we get exactly that. That. Our wishes are fulfilled. It's what the show is about, so it makes sense. You would think Ted Lasso is about Ted's coaching career, or maybe simply football, or even just moving to England. So in some ways, we don't get the ending you'd think we want. We may hate his decision to go home, and we can come up with all sorts of ways he could have made it work, Rebecca certainly tries, or come up with arguments about why he made the wrong choice, but you can't argue with his motivations. And I have to guess that a large number of people understood that and were happy about his decision because they recognize what the show is really about. And I have to guess those that think the show was too feel-good were totally confused confused and depressed for weeks after the finale. We love a flawed, wounded character, but too many of us idolize the wrong ones. 
and loving a character and emulating a character are very different. The irony of people thinking Pickle Rick is a total badass would be funny if it wasn't also kind of sad. The whole point of that episode is that Rick will literally turn himself into a pickle and then kill a dumpster ton of dudes all to avoid going to therapy. It's one long dudes will X instead of going to therapy. Does that mean we can't like the Pickle Rick episode? Heck no, it's awesome. Not to mention that Ted also avoids therapy and honestly has a decent reason to, especially considering his wife ends up dating the couple's therapist that Ted always felt had been pushing them apart, which is next level messed up. But he still sees Dr. Sharon, he still tries to better himself and those around him, and he still, in the end, does what he believes is genuinely best for his son, even if it means giving up his life at Richmond. I guess my point is Ted Lasso is what happens when the flawed, wounded character owns up to their own mistakes and weakness and commits themselves to personal growth. I love that it also shows that while it's great to spread sunshine on everyone around you, if you don't deal with your own issues, everything is going to fall apart. I can understand why on the surface people might not like the show. It's corny, it's so corny. Some of the needle drops feel like a bad sinus medicine commercial, but to be fair, others make me sob. Some things get wrapped up too quick, others not at all, but I gotta say, all of it feels intentional. Ted always seems to have the right thing to say, some anecdote or story from his past that is helpful in the moment. Like, literally always. Even when hustling a sucker billionaire at darts. And right when it almost feels like it's over the top, he compares being gay to being a Broncos fan and everyone calls him on it. He's not perfect, he's just trying his best, which is all any of us can do. What a f with them, the Broncos? No, well, no, that's a very oh, good question sake. too, yeah. It's an American football reference, an absolute fumble in this situation, I apologize. Sometimes we give advice to a friend when all they wanted was someone to listen. Doesn't mean we're jerks, we just got it wrong. Sometimes we throw a surprise party for our bestie when they actually hate surprises, and humans. Go figure. And then sometimes you're watching The Matrix Revolutions and your wife points out how a character's revealing dress seems to be the focus of a scene and we realize that the character's outfit is red, the color that represents distraction in the film series, so we try to point out that it's distracting and purposefully so, but then everyone thinks we're being creepy because instead of just stating it, we attempt to make a joke because that's what we do and it just goes terribly. Sometimes that happens. So does that mean I'm not YouTube Jesus? I guess it does. And if that puts me next to not sports Jesus, Ted Lasso, I think I'm doing all right. And today, what I wanted to do was give all of my Nebula viewers a special surprise that I've been hinting at all day. The fourth video I ever made that was copyright striked into oblivion for... Battlefield Earth. Possibly one of the worst movies ever made. It's the original video with terrible hanging frames and my somewhat deer in the headlights voiceover. I even had a Travolta win counter because, well, you'll have to go see for yourself. It'll never be on YouTube for the copyright reasons, but also because... I don't know, it's like showing you my hilarious self-portraits from third grade. It's just for my loyal Nebulites. I even have a few more from back in the day that I could upload, but we'll see. And if you don't have Nebula yet, you can sign up with my link and get it for 40% off, and you can watch all my videos ad-free, including all my exclusive content that will only ever be published there. And you know, y'all slept at my Metal Gear Solid video. That thing is the best, and obviously the best game ever made, so you should go watch that too. But there's way more for you on Nebula, including classes, full-length movies from your favorite creators, stage plays from your favorite creators, and so much more added every day. And with my link giving you 40% off an annual plan, it's like $250 a month. So go check it out and watch everything great about Battlefield Earth if you dare. You should dare. And now go watch the Women's World Cup. That's what this uh, what's all was. It was all just a big ad for the World Cup. I'm just kidding. I wanted to talk about Ted Lasso, and, you know, I will use any excuse to do things that I want to do. And now, everybody, Jamie Tart. I'm surrounded by pooper. It's just pooper. Let it flow. Yeah. Hi, just like in the sewer. <laughs>